welcome to our Maundy Thursday service. We are so grateful that you guys are joining us online and we'd love to engage with you in the chat. So make sure to say hi, whatever platform you're watching on and let us know where you're joining from. Tonight is gonna to be such a special night as we journey through the events that took place on the night leading up to Jesus' arrest and crucifixion. One of the key points of our service is gonna be when we come together as one church body and take communion. It's such a special thought to think about thousands gathering together locally and all across the United States and joining in communion just like Jesus did with his disciples during the Last Supper. We hope that if you received a communion box from us that you'll grab those items. And if not, feel free to find whatever you have in your house and join us in taking communion. It can be cookies or a cracker, water or juice, whatever it is that you have in your home, make sure to grab that and join us in communion and remembering the sacrifice that Jesus made just over 2000 years ago. During the service tonight, we're gonna journey in and out of moments of worship and teaching, and we hope that you'll stay engaged all the way through the end. Well, it's almost time for service to get started, so let's go live to the sanctuary. Good evening. It is good to be with you guys. Thank you so much for joining us on this Monday service. Want to thank you guys for watching with us, joining us online. It's so grateful to be with you guys. I did want to begin tonight explaining why we celebrate, why we remember Monday. And as I was thinking on the way here, I think in all my short years of being a Christian, I don't think I've ever been more aware of what the significance of this week carried. And if you really think about it, from birthdays to wedding receptions, all societies have developed ways of saying things by doing things. We tend to celebrate and remember the past with symbolic action today. This is true of Jesus' final moments with his disciples as he shares in a final supper or communion, if you will, together with his disciples and washes their feet. These acts of love and service are sealed by his words in John 13, verses 34 and 35. Jesus says, I am giving you a new commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you that you also love one another. 
By this, all people will know that you are my disciples. If you have love for one another, the word mandi is the Latin term which means command or mandate. This mandate to love was given on the Thursday of the Messiah's final week with his disciples, emphasizing one central thing, remembering what he had done among them and commissioning us to reflect what he had done among others. I want to preface what will happen tonight with why it will happen tonight. As we pray and worship in song and prophetic art from one of our elders, Elder Ronnie, and through this weekend, we choose to reflect the attitude of Jesus' final Thursday night as a symbolic action of remembrance. But what is it that we remember? We remember his loving submission to the hour rather than the honor of men. We remember his command to love rather than the call to hate. Let's begin by remembering him as our fir firm foundation tonight. And let's stand together. Let's sing together. Let's worship together as we journey through Maundy Thursday. Oh 
with anointing. Hallelujah, I am not alone. Assurance gives 
within me. Your spirit lives within me, so I will walk in your peace. Your spirit lives within me. You're my victory. You're my victory. Your spirit lives within me, so I will walk in your peace. Your spirit lives within Your spirit, your spirit lives within me, so I will walk in your peace. Your spirit lives within my victory, my victory, my victory. My victory. Your spirit lives within me, so I will walk in your peace. Your spirit lives within me, my victory. My for the cross. God, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. God, we thank you for your love and your compassion. God, we turn our hearts towards you tonight. Church, let's sing this together. How good is he? How good is he? He paints a canvas with a million 
stars And still he holds my heart, yeah Come on, all over the room tonight We sing our Father in heaven Lift your voices Our Father in heaven The light of salvation You sing Oh, how good is he The breath of Almighty the breath of Almighty before, behind me. Oh, how good is He? Oh, and how good is He?
may be seated. After an evening of fellowship and love, we come to the dinner table. But it's not just any dinner table. In the minds of the disciples that night, it was the Passover Seder. No doubt in their minds, they were remembering times when they had gotten together as families and heard the story over and over again about the salvation that came from people of Israel from their slavery in Egypt. They remembered things like the blood on the doorposts where the death angel passed over them. They remembered the cries of the mothers of the Egyptian firstborn as they died that night. It was a meal that was filled with symbolic cups of wine. The last one was the cup of fellowship. And Jesus would have picked up that cup and said these words that are recorded for us in the book of Exodus, chapter 6, verse 7. He would have picked up that cup of fellowship. He would have shown it to his disciples, and he would have said, I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God. And you shall know that I am the Lord your God who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. But that night, the disciples sensed that this was not that ancient story anymore. There was something new and fresh that Jesus was offering, a new story, a new life, built on a God who loved them and had want to have relationship with them and take away their sin so that they could have communion together. It was a special night. We've called this meal by a number of different names over the history of the church. And depending on your background, you will have called it one of these probably. The most formal name of it is the Eucharist which comes from the Greek verb eucharisto, which means to give thanks. And the root word in the middle of that verb is the word charis, which in Greek means grace. And so this meal that we're about to share is a meal of thanksgiving for the grace of God. We also call it the Lord's Supper based on 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 and following, where Paul is speaking to the church at Corinth. It says, for I, Paul himself, received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. That the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after he took the cup. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Paul was writing that to a church in Corinth that had messed up the whole event of the Eucharist. It had become a potluck dinner where some people filled themselves with food while they left others on the fringe starving. And he reminded them of what Jesus himself revealed to him about that night, that it was his body, his blood, it was his table. And so we call it the Lord's Supper. But the one we're most familiar with is the name communion, which is the coming together of believers to remember what Christ has done for us, for our brokenness, for our sin, for our failing him. He draws us together to remember the sacrifice he made that we could have life everlasting. And we call it communion. That meal has been interpreted in so many different ways over the years. For centuries, it's been proclaimed in art and in other ways. One of the, the most famous of all of those paintings is Da Vinci's The Last Supper. And I'm no art critic. It's always intrigued me though that everybody was sitting on the same time side of the table like they had 
you know, we're posing for the picture. And it was just a group of men at the table. It looked like a head table at a businessman's luncheon, and Jesus was the keynote speaker. But a few years ago, I had the privilege to go to Dubrovnik, Croatia. And there I saw a church that had been in place for over tw since 1200, since the 13th century. And in the niche of that church, there's a painting hanging there that was painted by Porbus II centuries ago. And it was his interpretation of the Lord's Supper. And at that table, the table was round, symbolizing the communion, the fellowship of the people around that table with Jesus. And another interesting fact about that picture, out of the, out of the ones who were sur surrounding the table, two of them, only two of them, are not bearded. They're fair-skinned and they have no facial hair. Their hair's a little more curly. They look dressed a little bit different than the others. And to me, he's depicting that there were women at that table, reminding us that all are welcome at the Lord's table. It's a beautiful painting. It's a beautiful interpretation of that night at that table. In the background of that picture, with a hood over his head, where, and in the shadows such that all you can see are his eyes, is a man walking away. And that is Judas, clearly shown as Judas, the one who was going to betray his Lord that night. We're all broken. We all do things that reject our Lord. And Pastor Aaron likes to remind us that just before that, Jesus has washed his feet too. He had washed Judas' feet. One other thing I would remind you about that community, that table in the round, it's very easy for us to get circled in together and turn our backs to the world behind us. As we reflect on Jesus and his love for us tonight, let's focus on him, but let's keep our eyes open to the one who might be behind us wanting to get to the table because there's always room for one more at his table. Now, before I share my last thought with you, I want to give you a little bit of instruction about what, how we're going to do this tonight. First of all, to those of you at home, uh, some of you received elements for the Lord's Supper from us, and we're grateful that you requested them and we sent them to you. So gather those. If you don't have that at home, just gather what you can to make uh, bread and juice. It doesn't matter what it is, crackers, whatever, and prepare to join with us in this meal. Now, for those of you here in the, in the house, we're going to have ushers come to each of your rows here in just a moment, and they're going to direct you to one of these tables around the room where you'll receive your bread, and then you'll go back to your seat. Your juice is in the seat back in front of you. When you get back to your seat, go ahead at, in your pace, at your time, as family or as an individual, however you want to do it, Go ahead and take communion on your own. We'll continue to worship until everybody's been served and everybody has participated. While we're worshiping, our team is going to come and sing a new song for us simply titled Jesus. It's a song that Mary Beth and Steve wrote. It's going to be released tonight at midnight on all of the music platforms, and you'll be able to get it from there. It's a beautiful piece of music that will be a great reflection for us while we worship together tonight. So listen and enjoy that with us. Now, before the ushers come, let me remind you of one other thing about that meal that night. When they broke the bread, they dipped it in a common bowl. They took the bread and they broke it and they dipped it and they ate it, and then they passed the cup bowl to the next person for his bread. They took the common cup, one cup, that cup of fellowship, 
and they passed it around and they shared it. And then they walked out, many of them to deny and forget about Jesus for a while. As we reflect tonight, we will not have a common cup and common bread, but we have a common heart, a common need for a savior, a common need to answer God's call to love one another and to love the world around us. Let's reflect on that as our ushers come and lead us in communion. name.
with us. We're going to continue on in worship. 
as we worship the King of Kings and Lord of Lords tonight. We say thank you, Jesus. Let's sing this together in the darkness. In the darkness we were waiting without hope and without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt we sing praise the father praise the Amen. If we can just stay in this moment um, right now. I don't know about you, but um, there's something about taking communion with the body and remembering what Jesus has done for all of us. This whole week, I've been really thinking a lot about the disciples and what actually they felt, what their feelings were, and even at times I would think, you know, what was the countenance on their face? What did Jesus see? What did they see? What did each other look like? What were they feeling at that moment? 
You know, despite all their circumstances, despite every emotion that they were feeling at the time, what totally amazes me is they chose to praise him and praise with him. And so tonight, what we get to do together is we get to focus on the Psalms called the Hallel Psalms, and it's Psalms 113 through 118. The word Hallel in the Hebrew means praise. And that is exactly what the disciples did with Jesus on that night before they left the table. So through those Psalms, we're gonna look at those tonight. We're not gonna read every Psalm, but we're gonna focus on a few verses. Jesus himself acting as head and head of that table that night in that guest room he would sing these hymns and psalms, and as he would sing those, the disciples would repeat the word, hallelujah. And so tonight, we're gonna get to say some of these psalms together, but before we do, I would like to focus on a few and read them to you. In Psalm 113, it says, from the rising of the sun, to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Some translations say, as far as east as it is to the west, the name of the Lord be praised. In Psalm 114, it says, the Red Sea saw them coming and they hurried out of their way. The water of the Jordan turned away Tremble, the mountains skip like rams, the hills like lambs. Tremble, O earth, at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of God of Jacob. He turned the rock into pool of water. Yes, a spring of water flowed from solid rock. He turned the rock into a pool of water. Yes, a pool of rock. I said that twice because I wanted y'all to get that twice. Okay. Psalm 115, verse one. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory for the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. I wanna just say in that Psalm that the Psalmist there was talking about comparing a life and a person that trusts in the Lord and then someone who trusts in man or idols. In Psalm 116, I want us to be able to say this together tonight. And you're not gonna repeat after me, we're just gonna say it in unison together. There is something about proclaiming and saying the word and the promises of the word over your life and doing it together. It has power. I love the Lord because he hears my voice and my prayer for mercy because he bends down to listen I will pray as long as I have breath. How kind the Lord is, how good is he. So merciful, this God of ours. The Lord protects those of childlike faith. I was facing death and he saved me. Let my soul be at rest again, for the Lord has been good to me. Psalm 117, it's actually the shortest psalm in the Bible and it's two verses and you can say it with me. Praise the Lord, all ye nations. Praise him, all you people of the earth for his unfailing love for us is powerful. The Lord's faithfulness endures forever. Praise the Lord. Amen. The final psalm that we're gonna say together is Psalm 118. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. Let all Israel repeat his faithful love endures forever. Let Aaron's descendants 
the priest repeat, his faithful love endures forever. Let all the fear of the Lord repeat, his faithful love endures forever. In my distress, I prayed to the Lord, and the Lord answered me and set me free. The Lord is for me, so I will have no fear. What can mere people do to me? The Lord is my strength and my song. He has given me victory. Amen. 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 There is such power in the Lord Jesus. There is such power in his words. The disciples drank. They broke bread together. They listened. They received. And they also praised with the Lord. As they got up from the table that night, Judas had already left. They made their way, it says in Mark and in Matthew, after singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Before Jesus going to the Garden of Gethsemane, there they went to the evening campsite. As they went, who was left were the 11 disciples and Jesus before his great act of love, because he is love. He has empowered all of us to love each other and to go and do the work of the Lord. May you feel his love tonight as we continue on. some time and just reflect on the words and the scripture that we just heard together. And 
I will be still and know you are God and I will be still know you are God oh you are God sing this last chorus together of I surrender and I surrender all I surrender all all to thee my blessed Savior I surrender all one more time we sing together and I song together once you stand with us as we sing perfect son of God in all his innocence you're walking in the dirt with you and me he knows what living is he's acquainted with our grief man of sorrow son of suffering oh blood and tears how can it be there's a God who weeps, there's a God who bleeds. Oh, praise the one who would reach for me. Hallelujah to the Son of Suffering. Some imagine you are distant. us down in merciful pursuit. To the sinner you were graced, and the broken you embraced. And in the end the proof was in your lips. And in the end the proof was in your God in heaven, your blood 
a God who bleeds. Oh, praise the one who would reach for me. Hallelujah to the son of suffering. I want you to have a seat as we move into the last part of the night. You know, it's so true that Jesus was acquainted with grief. He was well aware of what our own selfish desires produce. The Bible calls those selfish desires sin. Jesus had seen firsthand what sin does in our life. He saw that sin leads to death. And Jesus knew that he had to do something to set us free from its power. And all throughout the night with the disciples, Jesus continually demonstrates not only his mandate to love one another, but he also reminds them about his willingness to serve. From the moment that he drops to the floor and washes their feet, to when he shares communion with them, to when they worship together, Jesus constantly emphasizing that the kingdom of God is not about selfishness. It's about one another. It's about being selfless. Jesus demonstrates this in a prayer that he prayed that night. John 17, 20, he said, I am praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. He's talking to his heavenly father and he says, I have given them the glory you gave me. I've served, I have given what I have received for this purpose so they may be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. That night, as the disciples neared the end of their journey that night, Jesus realized that his journey to set us free from the power of sin was just beginning. As they left the upper room, worshiping together, they came to a garden to pray. It was a garden that Jesus had often visited. And John's, the apostle John's record of this, in the book of John is, I think relevant for us to look at tonight as we consider the sacrifice of Jesus. John writes this in chapter 18, verse one, he says, after saying these things, Jesus crossed the Kidron Valley with his disciples and entered a grove of olive trees. Judas, the betrayer, knew this place because Jesus had often gone there with his disciples. I love that we have a savior who wasn't hiding he went exactly where he knew Judas would know to find him. Leading priests and Pharisees had given Judas a contingent of Roman soldiers and temple guards to accompany him. And it's important that we understand that this was not just a small group of people. In fact, our best research indicates that this was probably a force of 300 to 600 armed soldiers who came to arrest this one man. And with blazing torches, lanterns, and weapons, they arrived at the olive grove. And verse four is what's significant for us tonight. 
It says, Jesus fully realized all that was going to happen to him. In that moment, he fully realized the pain, the suffering, the agony that it would cost to set us free from the power of sin. He fully realized the cost of his sacrifice. And this was his response. The rest are verse four. So he stepped forward to meet them. Jesus did not wait to be found. He initiated and he said, who are you looking for? They said, Jesus, the Nazarene. And he simply said, I am he. Judas who betrayed him was standing with him. And then John includes something that no other gospel includes. Significant. It says, as Jesus said, I am he, they all drew back and fell to the ground. I mean, imagine that. Hundreds of soldiers fall to the ground simply because he said a simple phrase like, I am he. But the reality is that that phrase was anything but simple. Because in that phrase, what Jesus was doing was acknowledging exactly who he was that he was not just a great man, not just a great teacher or a miracle worker, that he was God himself, God in flesh. And the best way to understand what happened in that moment was that as Jesus said and acknowledged his identity, that some sliver of his glory was revealed and that those soldiers could not stand under the weight of that glory. They fell to their knees. But why would John include this detail? I mean, why point this out? Because John's goal in his gospel was to point out to us that at no point was Jesus ever not in control. Jesus was always in authority. Jesus was not a victim on the cross. He willingly chose it, knowing full well what it would cost, the weight of our sin. He knew it and he chose it and he stepped forward. In fact, Jesus says this himself earlier in the Gospel of John. He says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, talking about those who followed him, and my sheep know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. No one takes it from me but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. John trying to capture what he saw in Jesus that night. He didn't see a victim who was led to the cross without, without desiring to go there. He saw the King of glory step forward in authority and power to conquer the power of sin and death. And he did it, not by might, but by surrender. Jesus willingly laying down his life for us, knowing what it would cost, he stepped forward. But you know, that is the, the gospel message, right? That God sees us in our brokenness and our imperfections and our failures and our sin, and he stepped toward us, he stepped forward, he reached toward humanity, and he pulls us up out of our sin and imperfection that we could not get out of on our own and that we did not deserve. And he pulls us out, not just to forgive us for our sins, but to invite us into a relationship. Would you bow your heads tonight, close your eyes. Let's pray together. Lord, I am so thankful that your word says that it is your kindness that leads us to repent, that leads us to turn away from our selfish desires and to turn toward you, to follow you. It is your kindness revealed in the person of Jesus that night as he stepped forward in authority and power and surrendered his heart surrendered his life, took on the form of a servant, 
for us to have relationship with us. You know, maybe you're here tonight or you're watching online. And when I talk about a relationship with God, if you're really honest, you've never experienced that. Or maybe you've walked with God in the past, but you find yourself far from him tonight. What better night than on this Thursday night as Jesus talked about loving one another, demonstrated his sacrifice, what better night to surrender our hearts to him. I wanna lead you in a prayer that you, you can pray this in your own words. Heavenly Father, I recognize that you loved me enough to send your son to die for me, to set me free from the power of my own mistakes, failures, my own sin. Jesus, thank you will never be enough for what you did for us. But tonight, I surrender my heart to you. I invite you to be my Lord, my Savior, and my King. I believe that you are the only way to God, that you are the truth, and that you are the source of life. And tonight, I want to experience that life. I want to experience that relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen. From that moment in the garden, Jesus was arrested. He was illegally tried. He was falsely accused and condemned to die. Tomorrow, on Friday, we will remember the sacrifice, the ultimate sacrifice that he paid on the cross. And Saturday was a dark day for the disciples. But we know that Sunday was coming. And we want to invite you to celebrate with us what Jesus did that separates Christianity from any other religion on earth. And on Sunday, we will celebrate that together. Thank you for going on this journey with us tonight. We hope you have a great night. God bless.